Credit Center, CUNY, Midtown, Manhattan, in the heart of Manhattan, or in the heart of darkness, as some say, but the light is, seems to be coming in through the cracks. Um, things look a bit more um, optimistic. There's been talk of opening uh, the city, uh, July 4th, openings of theaters in uh, well, September 14th or 15th. So um, we are all very cautious and a little bit uh, uh, curious to know how it will really all work out. But um, these are good signs. And, um, and uh, in this long year of Corona, I think um, we are on a different way. But the big question really is, uh, what did we learn? Uh, what do, did we need to learn? Have we learned what we need to learn? What will be different? What already has changed? And artists always have been part of change. They are the one who help us uh, guide us through these uh, uh, moments also of significant changes in societies and uh, in our lives. And um, we at the Siegel Center now also talk uh, to curators, producers, writers, academics, thinkers um, about the theater, the state, of this theater, the Weltzustand, the state of the world. And with us today, we have a very beloved member um, of the New York um, theater uh, community, someone who um, has made an enormous uh, contribution and he made uh, New York uh, performing art scene. Uh, also what it is, it's uh, people like him who created, we have with us Lucien Sayan, um, who is uh, uh, sitting at home in his kitchen and a little bit more about that. He created the invisible dog, everybody, who moves in the experimental art and dance, uh, knows about him and adores his work. Um, I once had the uh, pleasure to perform there and I got my only critique, my line as a dancer in the New York Times. Um, it was a choreography project of Michael Clean, which he did and uh, hosted as so many, many other things. Lucia, thank you for uh, joining us later. The great choreographer and director, Raja Heather Kelly will join us too, who does a lot of work. At, the Invisible Road. Lucia, how are you? Where are you? Are you in the south of France? Uh, hello. Thanks for having me, um, Frank. It, it's a real pleasure. Uh, you know, for, for the whole year of um, the past year, I only did three Zoom. So, wow. Um, yes, I'm, I'm an anti-Zoom activist. OK. Um, but I cannot refuse um, your invitation. Um, so. I accept it. I'm, I'm pretty well. I'm not in the south of France. I'm on Bergen Street in Brooklyn, where I live and where I work, because the Invisible Dog is just next door, just here. This is my little kingdom. And uh, I never left New York City um, since the beginning of the pandemic. That was a real choice to stay here and to leave the city with the city and with the, the people here during this whole time. And that was absolutely fantastic. I love New York even more now. And that is incredible, incredible. But for all of us who do not know enough about Lucien, um, let me tell you a little bit about him. He was born in Marseille. I think his family uh, is of Egyptian background. Um, also, um, he was born there, moved to Paris when he was 19. He worked at a major French cultural institutions like Théâtre de l'Odéon, was an important theater, which I think for also was Théâtre de l'Europe, was a European... Uh, it was actually, yes, it was actually the very beginning. It's when the Odéon separated from the Comédie Française and mm -hmm. became completely independent and um, was only focused on European theater. So all the production, 70% of the production we had were in other languages than French. It was Hamlet in, Rum in Romanian, or um, Shakespeare in Italian, or um, and it was absolutely fantastic years. Yes, it was okay. very, very exact, exciting time. Mm -hmm. The great uh, George's trailer worked there a lot, and many, many others. It was like trailer, Boo, like that, Peter, right? Peter Zadek, Luc yeah. Bondy, Patrice Chéreau, all these people were. Yes, all these people. Yeah, it was a destination like Bam, where you, if you got to that theater and if you were in there, it also meant you know. Um, your work is respected by your colleagues, by fellow artists, but also um, by 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 um, the Parisian, you know, or European theater theater crowd. And that counts for a lot. He also worked uh, in Aix en Provence, Festival d'Art Lyrique, and uh, Théâtre de la Madeleine. And um, then he took a little break and came uh, to New York, and he discovered the Invisible Dog. He will tell us a little bit more um, about it um, and the story um, behind it. And in the time of 
Corona. And as I think also that time before, he also moved into a world, you know, we all uh, got closer to the world of food, of nutrition. And, um, and But he perhaps, as with everything he does, he dove a little bit deeper um, into it. Um, like some say, the animals, the seals, they go into the ocean, they go so deep. Sometimes they even lose consciousness. They, and nobody really knows why. There's no reason for it. And I think um, humans, artists, producers often do that in the we benefit um, uh, uh, from it. So, um, Lucia, tell us a little bit about um, why did you move to New York? I moved to New York in 2008 uh, because I was, I think, at the end of a cycle. I was in the beginning of my 40s, so I was probably in middle age crisis, and I was really tired, even exhausted of everything, of my life, of my professional life, of, um, and I need a change. And I didn't know what to do. So I looked on the map and said, where can I go? I knew I wanted to go far from France, but I didn't know where exactly. And actually, New York City was the most attractive city for me. I didn't know New York really well. I came here maybe once or twice before, but as a tourist, I didn't have so much connection here. Actually, I didn't know anybody here. And that was my decision to come in the city where I didn't know anyone and I would be totally alone and far from everything. And, um, and I did it. I decided to come to spend three months here. Three, why three months? Because three months is just the time of the visa. Mm -hmm. It's the maximum time you can spend here. Mm -hmm. And um, to be very honest, uh, I almost gave up after a few weeks here because October 2008 was the beginning of the recession here. Yeah. And it was awful. Everything was awful. Yeah. Um, people were crying, losing their job. Um, America was, everything was collapsing everywhere. And in addition to that, I didn't know what was a winter in New York City. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I didn't have a coat warm enough i didn't have the right shoes to walk in the in the snow everywhere and it was very 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 difficult but uh, i said three months i stayed three months and at, almost at the end of my stay i've discovered this building on bergen street um, it's a four thousand square feet building it's a beautiful building made in brick and wood built in 1863 and the building was empty there was nothing there was just a sign on it uh, written for these and just by curiosity I called the number and I asked may I visit the building and the landlord actually was his office was just next door so he came immediately and he gave me a tour of the building and I literally fell in love with the building and not only fall in love it's the building inspired me the project like all of the sudden everything made for the last 12 years at the Miserable Dog came into my mind. And it's funny because I found recently an email I sent to a friend saying, I just discovered, like that was 12 years ago, I've just discovered a building, it's beautiful. I want to make a project here. And I described a little thing and it's exactly how it is um, now. Um, so it was the building really inspired me. That two minutes before, I would have never thought about something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I talked about the landlord. I said, I want to do this project here. What do you think? And he said, can you pay the rent? Of course. And um, I said, I don't know. I don't have any money. And he answered, I don't have money too. So we have to find a way to work together. And he said, yes. So I went back to France. I wrote him a project. And I came back here in April 2009. Um, and the Invisible Dog opened in 2000, October 2009 um, with really something I, was, I, was, uh, I wanted to do for a very long time is to create a multidisciplinary space for artists. Because I worked all my life in, mostly in theaters and opera, but I worked also for dance. And everything was in a box. Like when we do theater, we don't do anything else than theater. There is no connection between theaters and museum. There is no connection between museum and dance companies and like that. And I really wanted a multidisciplinary space where people are not coming to see something specific. They're just coming to a venue. Let's go there. And um, 
And I did it one year, two years. Now it's 12, and in September, we will open the 13th season of The Invisible Dog. That's the whole story. Just um, incredible that um, from this side or on site, as Bertie Friedman writes about, you know, you got an uh, inspiration. You, it is a New York story, and unfortunately, um, we don't hear so many of them often now. Oh, there is, there is administration, and they try to get into an institution, and they do service for three years, and then hope to run something like uh, um, uh, very different uh, uh, approach. And you came, you said, I had no idea where to go. I have no money. I thought New York is an interesting town and you saw an empty space and you didn't even know how to pay for it, which I don't know, we have to tell us a little bit how we did it, but that is an incredible but story. My, my force, you know, sometimes it's like kids. Uh, kids, they don't know that if they put their hands on the oven, they get burnt. They don't know that really until they really put the hands on, on the oven. And it was the same for me. I didn't have any fear because I didn't know anything about New York. I didn't know anything how the art was funded. I didn't know anything. Yes, the only thing I knew is there was no public money here. That's the only thing I knew a little bit because in France, we have a lot of public money. Actually, we only have, we mostly have uh, public money. I, that, I knew that little bit. So, but I didn't have any rules. I didn't have, I remember at the beginning I was talking with people. I said, oh, I would like to do that. And they were telling me, oh, you can't. Yeah. And I said, why? Why I can't? Oh, you can't do something like that. And I was doing, I was trying everything because I needed to survive. I needed to create my product. So I didn't wait for any foundation or any institution to to support me or to give me money. I just create my own business. And I said, I have to generate money in a certain way. And with this money, I will pay my rent. I will pay the gas, the electricity, the internet. And then with the profits with the left, I would be able to produce some, some work. And I did it like that. The first year I did $800 profit at the end of the year. It was not very much, but it was, I was still very happy to not create a deficit. It's incredible, yeah. So you rent out part of it, or how was your how how do you make so it? The, it, it's a, it's, so it's a very simple business model. The business mod model is based on real estate. So I have four thousand square feet of the Invisible Dog. Um, two thirds of the Invisible Dog is rented um, as artist studios. So I have artists in the building. They rent a space. Um, they come work every day. I call them the heart of the Invisible Dog because <laughs> we don't see them. But that's why the Invisible Dog is, a, is, is alive, it's probably because of them. And then the other third is the public space of the Invisible Dog, the main gallery on the, on the ground floor. So it's a 4,000 square feet gallery. And here I generate incomes, not at, with the box office because everything is free at the Invisible Dog. I don't charge any tickets. Um, it's based on donation only, but I run the space for weddings, bar mitzvahs, in between exhibition, in between performances. And then a few years after, I start to have co-production with other institutions like PS122 and Vallejo Gantner when he was um, running um, Coil Festival. Um, Carla Peterson from New York Life, Lab, Life Art also was one of the first to come and co-produce a show with me at the Invisible Dog. And slowly like that. Um, it's at the very beginning here, I opened a, a bank account in New York City and I asked for a credit card. And a few days after they emailed me saying my, my, my application was declined. And I, I said, why it's declined? Why I can't have a credit card? But I didn't know the difference between a credit card and a debit card. And I don't know what is it to create a debt. It's just, I'm not made like that. I don't have this American system where I'm using credit card to pay that and that and that. So I'm only using the money I have. So it was very simple. If I don't have money, I can't do anything. It, it, it is incredible what you created. You gave a home to so many artists, companies. And when one comes to the invisible dog, one has the feeling one is with friends or is a part of a family. It's like a, you know, someone who you know, who owns a house in the countryside and they welcome you, you know, and, um, 
but you know how much they work to keep it up, to keep it running in the cold and the dark and all of it. So it's, it's a, a unique space. It's a community you created. Yeah, because it's a, it's a little village. There is like 100 person working every day at the Invisible Dog, artist, assistant. It's like a very small town. So uh, that's invisible. Nobody sees that, but um, that's a big part of my job to run the space, to keep the space open, clean, with heat. Oh. It's in incredible. Lucien, let me ask you, especially at the time of Corona, um, why are you doing this? I think, um, Again, as I told you at the beginning, I didn't have the idea. I didn't want to do that. Um, I always loved being uh, the second or being um, hidden. Um, and I never had, I didn't know I was able to create something myself. So it really came um, organically like that. And why I would do that? I think it's only by pleasure. The pleasure is a very, very big part of uh, my life. Like I wake up in the morning with the pleasure of waking up already. That's the first thing. And I probably am sleeping with pleasure also. So I do everything by pleasure. And I have to say the invisible dog gives me a lot of this pleasure every single minute. Like I'd never had in 12 years um, a moment where I was bored, it's always exciting. It's always fun. It's 100% drama free. There is, no, there is no bureaucracy at the Invisible Dog. We are two, the staff of the Invisible Dog is two person and me and someone else. And um, the bureaucracy is limited that it's really minimum. There is never a contract with the artist. It's just check hand. We ha I have a word and I keep my word. Um, there is no promises we can't hold. So everything is very easy. Uh, there is a few years ago, a landlord from in Goa lives here, a neighborhood very close from here, emailed me and said, can I call you? I have, I have a lot of problems with my tenants. And I said, yes, of course. So he called me and he explained to me that his tenants, artists, were not taking care of the building, leaving the light on, the garbage in the corridor and all of that. And he, he asked me, how do you, they don't pay the rent on time? How do you deal with that? And I said, well, I'm sorry to say, but I don't have this kind of problem at the Invisible Dog. Why? Because I'm there every day. I'm present every day. Anybody can talk to me at any time. And, um, and I think that's the secret of the pleasure. Like everything is smooth, everything is easy. Um, and it's the same for the program um, I curate at the Invisible Dog. It's mostly based on the pleasure to work with artists. Um, I, the project itself, I'm not always interested in. I'm mm -hmm. more interested in what artists are going to do in the space, how they're going to use the space. Then if they do something good, it's great. If they don't do something good, it's fine also. It's okay. I don't have to worry about that. How do you connect to the artist? How do they come to you? How do you select them? Uh, I know you have to make choices as you are a presenter, if you like it or not, but you Yes, are. like, like, like I think like, there is no secret. There, well, there is no secret. There's not really a secret or recipe about that. It's just like, some artists come to you. I come a lot to the artists. I have to go. And since I'm a multidisciplinary space, I'm not doing only dance or theater or visual art. I do all of that. So I have to visit artists in their studio, uh, go see performances, um, talk with them. Instagram has been a real change in the way you meet artists. Um, for example, today, Instagram is probably, I would say, 30% of my research, I spend them on Instagram. I'm not traveling to European festival, things like that. So everything is focused on here um, in New York. And um, but yeah, they come to you. Uh, but again, an artist can come to you with a very good project. It's not enough uh, because you need the time, you need a real connection. And I really think 
that the way I have created Invisible Dog, there's many things happening. I left France. There was a recession here. This building was closed. My landlord was desperately looking for someone to do something with the building. So there was a, a, almost a complot, a coup made by the stars to create the Invisible Dog. And I think it's the same with the artist. And artists come at the right time, the right moment, with the right project, and and we do it. Hmm. No, it's it's amazing. It's a, maybe the, one of the closest things we have to that old idea of La Mama, where Ellen Stewart, you know, who ran a place, who she also fought for it. Also, in a way, like you, where one could say more on the outsider than an insider. She was a woman. She was a black woman uh, who said, "I want to bring." Uh, uh, also international artists, it was only the Asian society that brought puppet plays or stuff from the around the world to New America. Nobody had done it. Um, and, um, and she created it from a very small basement with bigger theater than into La Mama. Yeah. And the work is, um, is uh, um, in a way, um, close, close to that. that. This time of Corona, it was interesting what you said. You said you never left New York. You said here, what what happened with your space? Did anything change? Well, um, not really. To be very honest, not so much. Um, of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, nobody believed that that would last so long. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was talking about three weeks, and actually, it was True. I was very happy. I said, "Oh, fine, three weeks off, it's great." Um, and so nothing bad. But then um, when all of a sudden we realized that how serious was the situation here, um, I, I had a moment of stress. I'm not, I'm not stressed at all in general. I'm very relaxed. Um, as my friend knows, I always say, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Everything's fine. Don't worry. All of that is only music or theater or dance or art. So it's not a big deal. You can find solution for everything. Um, I had a little moment of stress. Yes, of course. But uh, the stress was probably generated by also my surroundings, what's going on in the city. Like people die, people sick, the sound of the ambulance all day long, night and day. So it was, it was, it was very difficult. But very quickly, I realized that uh, the Invisible Dog was extremely, extremely stable because none of the artists who have their studio at the Invisible Dog left. They all stayed here. So already, as I said, the heart of the Invisible Dog was beating. The heart of the Invisible Dog never stopped. So when your heart's still working, everything's fine. You can be a little bit off or in a coma or something like that, but the heart is still beating. So they came to and the studios, they worked, they continued working. No, no, no. The first two months, nobody came to the studio. It was like, or maybe two or three. There, was, there are 27 artists in the building. Uh, so maybe only two or three were coming. Most of them were staying home. Um, but they didn't break their lease. They paid their rent and all of that. So everything was fine. Of course, we had to cancel events. We have to cancel productions. We have many things like that. And there was a big loss of, of income. That's absolutely certain, but not enough to put Invisible Dog in danger. And actually, after um, maybe four months after the beginning of the, of, the, of the pandemic, after March something, 17, I realized that we were safe. And if I was managing well the situation, everything would be fine. Um, for example, I've been very shocked um, in April when a lot of art institutions start to ask for money. Like the first thing they did is give us money. We need money. We need money to survive. And really, I was very, very shocked by that. I said, there are so many other things to do than asking for money right now. It's not the right thing. There's people dying. There is people losing their jobs. There is, and when I said people, um, of course I'm thinking about the artists and especially the artists in the performing. The artists of the visual art world, they were fine 
more or less, because they were working for them. It was a moment to focus on their studio and paint and draw and, and sculpting. And so that was, but visual art was, um, sorry, performing art was extremely violent to imagine. In, all of a sudden, you have no more work, nothing to do. And you still have these institutions who are asking for money. And I was very, very mad at that. Actually, I wrote something about that um, publicly. Um, so my first what decision was- What did you say? Tell us a bit, what did you write? But I, I, wrote, I said that, I said, you should more focus on what's going on to the artist. How is their, how's their life? Instead of asking for money, for you to run your, your space, that's, for me, it was really, um, ah, I don't want to use like so much like hard word, but it was really insane to do something like that. It was not, that was not nice to do that. And, and many of them did that from the biggest one, the Met, uh, the MoMA, uh, Brooklyn Museum didn't do it. For example, um, Anne Pasternak wrote an absolutely amazing newsletter in April, talking about how we have to take care of each other, how, what's the mission of the Brooklyn Museum to take care of people from Brooklyn. That was absolutely beautiful. And she did nowhere in the email. There was not even a link saying, give money. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, that was, she was a real inspiration um, during this period. But anyway, um, there was one thing to do, yes, was to focus on mostly that, the artists, because it's we work because of them. We are able to do all of that because of them. If we don't have artists anymore, our job doesn't make any sense. We, um, I'm sorry to say that, um, but uh, without artists, there is no producer, there is no curator, there's nothing like that. So we need them, absolutely. And they needed us this time not to produce their work, they needed us to pay their bill, to pay their rent, to buy food. I was sending almost every day $20 here because artists were asking me, can you give me 20? They, were, they needed that $20. So with an artist of the Invisible Dog, her name is Anne Mourier, we created a fund uh, called the Taking Care Fund. And we raised in really a couple of weeks, $50,000 $50, and we invited artists to apply, but the application was just an email. Why would you use this money? Why do you need this money? And the email were incredible because really people were saying, I need to pay my phone. I need to pay my gas bill. I need to buy food. I haven't be able to go to the, to the supermarket um, for several days now. Uh, I'm hungry. And the money was wired in less than 24 hours. That was the goal, immediately. Give them that and they can, and they didn't have to tell us afterward why, the, how they use the money, what did they do is, was just a gift. Um, so that was, that was um, a real um, moving moment of, 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 this, of this pandemic. Yes, when we did that. And then, you know, life came back almost um, organically, um, summer arrived, things relaxed a little bit, and in September... Yeah, we, it looks like we um, lost a bit um, the connection from this year. Um, oh, yeah, now I'm still you're hearing back. you. Yeah, now you're back we are for a second. So I don't, know, I don't know where you lost me. Uh, you said life no. came back, life was coming back. Yes, and slowly life came back in September when we opened the Invisible Dog with, the, of course, with safety uh, measure, but um, with a new exhibition from uh, Stephen and William Ladd. And so, of course, everything is slower. Invisible Dog, usually we have four or five events a week, parties, uh, openings, performances, people coming and staying, hang out late night. It's not the case anymore, but it's fine. I go to bed very early now. I sleep very early. Did something change in your thinking in the time of Corona about art, about what you do? Yes, definitely. Uh, it's maybe too early to say, um, but you can't, it's, uh, in my opinion, you can't go through um, 
something like the pandemic, this pandemic, without a major change in the way you think, in the way in your relationship with others. Um, there is, a, <clears throat> I'm reading this book and I want to just, uh, she's a Japanese author. And she wrote this book called 961 Hours in Beirut, in Lebanon. She was invited for a residency here. And when she, right after she left, the explosion happened. Mm -hmm. So she had to rewrite the book because how can you um, ignore such a moment? And it's, it's fantastic because she explained how our future is defined with before and after it, when something happened when something when an event happened all of the sudden the before and the after get visible when they were not before without the pandemic nothing would have happened um, but the pandemic immediately created a before and an after and I can't imagine it will be exactly the same, but again, I said it's really too early to say uh, what has changed. Um, the way we walk, the way we take much more time to do everything, we enjoy um, the company of less people, maybe, but more deeper. Uh, there is definitely a kind of superficiality that has disappeared here in New York City. All the social thing of New York City, as, 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 as it was, has disappeared, it seems. Um, we don't feel obligated to go there, get, do that, do that, do that, not anymore. And that's, I think, it's a good thing. And we have more time. We can read, we can talk, we can just look at the ceiling or cook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll come to that a bit later. Um, <laughs> Why do you think art, I mean, you, uh, for your work in France at Lodeon and here, art seems to be at the center of it. Why do you, why do we need, why do, you say, why, why do we need art? Where are the, where's the need? Especially in this time of pandemic where we were officially non-essential uh, in a way. But uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about it? Well, uh, not everybody needs art. It's like, and, and actually I would say, uh, as we define art, of us here but definitely art is everywhere the flower you look at is well, when you walk in the in the forest or, or a piece of art the, the sky is a piece of art everything is a piece of art and everybody has eyes so since we have eyes we can see art everywhere um, so I don't I, I won't say we don't need art uh, when you go to the church there's art everywhere so you you're confronted to art everywhere so, but we need, we need art, you, me, and probably people who are listening to us. It's just because um, it's, it's, it's our food. Without that, we don't know do anything else. So it's, it's not even essential. It's a question of, of survive. If we, if we don't have this contact with art and, and artists to give us their vision, to give us, to share their, you know, they are the only one who see the future. We don't see the future. We see the future because of them. Without them, we won't see the future. But, um, and that's why art is very important. Um, let's say, um, I, I know you did mostly now exhibitions, but let's say by September, really everything opens. Um, are you going to go back how it was at the Invisible Dog? No, definitely. Or you think it will be radically different from what you did? No, it will be radically different. What's going yes. to be different? For example, so for example, um, usually an exhibition at the Invisible Dog, it's five weeks. And definitely now exhibition will be 10, maybe 15 weeks, much longer. Um, same performance, we don't know yet. So we don't know when we'll be able to do that again. Um, it's very confusing, this message, New York reopen. It's very, very confusing because I don't know how the city and the state can just decide like that. Yeah. Everything we open and uh, it's over. It's not. So, um, 
I'm very careful with that. Uh, but um, yes, and again, but I can't really tell you how things will change. It's. But conceptually, will you say I have more theater, my performance, more exhibitions, more community project, or more? Uh, no, no, because no, because be, no, because. Yet. Because the invisible dog is all of that already, all of that. and and yes, it's all of that already, and and there is no, there is no, f it's it, there is no frame at the invisible dog of the way I, I I make my program. The program comes, whatever projects um, are ready to be done, and um, it's very very very, I, it's very important to me, and since the beginning, to keep. The invisible dog extremely flexible. You know this this very famous fable of le chien et le roseau. So the, the chien, I don't know what's the chien is this big tree. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's the chien in, in English? The chien, the oak. Oak chien. Oak. Yeah, the big one, solid. And um, and le roseau, le roseau, it's the the cane. You know the sugar like the, the cane, thing yeah, thing like that. Yeah. So it's a very famous French fable. You learned that at school. And it's conversation about this big solid tree is there for many, 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 many centuries. And this very skinny and light cane like that. And there is a big wind that day. And, 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 and the, at the beginning, the tree says, oh, I'm solid. I have no problem with me, but the wind is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the cane is just doing that when the tree can't, doesn't have any flexibility. And at the end, the tree falls. That's the, so the flexibility, I think it's, it's really um, a survival kit of every institution. We have to be extremely flexible now. Going back to less, uh, less structure. Be more. I know it's not easy for everybody, but um, I think that's the key of the future. Yes, be even more flexible. Hmm. Yeah, I just see that um, Raja is is, is uh, joining us, you know, and um, Great. tell us a bit um, about um, his work. So, hi there. Hi. Hello. <laughs> so you were rehearsing just right now, right? Yep. So you're uh, a working artist in New York at the moment rehearsing. Tell us, what are you working on? Oh man, uh, I'm working on two projects. Um, I'm working on a project that I can't say the title of it, but I'm currently editing it and it will have a premiere in June. And another show called Wednesday that will premiere in December uh, at New York Live Arts. And when you said editing it, will it be on, on screen? Is it designed for screen? Or? Yeah, one one is um, a, a media project, um, and the other the other was a live performance. Fantastic! That's that's so good to know that you are all out there. And um, for all of everyone who isn't uh, so familiar with Raja's work, he is a choreographer and a director, and he's the artistic director of the new Brooklyn Theater. He founded uh, in two thousand nine the dance theater media company Feather Theory, and the two companies actually merged, and he has gotten significant award, major awards, and many of them, the Creative Capital Award, the National Dance Project Production Grant, the Breakout Award from the Stage Directors and Choreographers Foundation. And he has the Dance Magazine's inaugural um, Harkness Promise Award, the Solange MacArthur Award um, for new choreography, and he's a three-time Princess Grace Award winner, and uh, he is born in Fort Hood in Texas, uh, was a BA in dance and English from Connecticut College, so it's quite a, quite a most impressive uh, 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 CV, which you already have here. So tell me, what does, the, what does the invisible dog mean to you? Oh my gosh, the invisible dog gave me my first evening show, full trust, and put me on the map, for sure. Um, in two thousand, did it happen? Um, in 2013, I believe it was, I was slated to premiere like my first evening length show in New York City. And it was going to be at a place called Dance New Amsterdam, uh, which is currently right. now Gibney. <laughs> and it had closed down. And so our show was canceled. And I emailed Lucien and I said, hi, my name is Raja. I'm a choreographer and I would love to do my 
show at your space. And I think everyone emails like that, like very scared. <laughs> and Lucien said, I think three things to me. I don't know who you are, um, but you can use the space, um, do whatever you want. Um, and that sort of changed my life. I think no, no, no other presenter or, or artistic director of a theater has ever said to me, like, do what you want. <laughs> And that, that is, it really shaped me as an artist because I expected that moving forward, any space I went to, any theater, I was like, don't I just get to do what I want? That's how I was treated when I first moved to New York and started making work. And, and that, that meant a lot to me. And, and I think it was one of my, my best works because of that. Mm. Yeah. And and then he did The Impossible, which also doesn't happen in New York. After I premiered the show in December, Lucien said, do it again, like six months later. And I said, Lucien, that doesn't happen in New York. You know, you, you do it and it's over. And he said, well, I, I think you should do it again. It was great. And, and I thought no one would come to see it again, but we, we sold out the first time. And when we did it the second time, six months later, we sold out again. So I, many lessons I learned in that, in that time. Mm. No, that's that is a, it, it's such an interesting space, and perhaps it has some answers um, for us. And Lucian was just talking that he was able to be flexible in this time of Corona. Artists state uh, the model that artists are kind of you know own the building in the sense of they also rent it and pay for it. It's theirs, but it's also looked over by him, and uh, and it kept uh, uh, the doors open. Did fundraising for the artists in a way. Um, how are you experiencing New York at the moment? You're an artist, you're a dancer. Um, some say only poets have a harder time than dancer, you know, uh, if you're an artist. Um, um, so um, so t tell us, about how are you experiencing this year of Corona? Yeah, it's, I would say it's a bit back and forth. And, and some, in some cases, I feel more connected to my creativity than I ever have because I'm not worried about bureaucracy. I'm not worried about logistics. I'm not worried about making people happy. I'm not worrying about awards. I'm not worrying about anything other than what fulfills me on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm just sitting with myself and I'm just communicating with my friends and people who, who make collaborating exciting. And, and that, that has been a, a fantastic reminder during this time and something I feel fortunate because I have my health to continue to do. And yet on the other side, I feel very confused around like what our, what is our field? What do we do as theater makers? And who are we supporting as theater makers? And, and there's been a bit of a veil lifted where I'm looking at it and I'm seeing lots of issues that have always been there and both a desire to remain a creative and to remain in the field and at the same time a desire to, to for it to just be over <laughs> and to be done. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's a very, you know, when, when we say the word interesting, uh, my, what I understand about that word is that interesting means between two things. And so when I say interesting, I mean it. I think it's a very interesting place to be in because it's between mm -hmm. something that I really love and something that I feel is my, my responsibility and my, the core of me, my blood is to be an artist and between this thing where I'm disgusted by it and confused by it and want it to be different and better. Mm, yeah, it's almost fun space on the threshold in a door frame and there are two rooms and you're in, in between both of them. Lucia, yeah. um, when I invited you to come uh, to the Siegel Talk, not only you said right away, yes, even on a short notice, but um, you said, I want uh, Raja with me. Why? Uh, because, uh, do, as I told you before, uh, during this, this past year, um, there was a few people in our life, mostly because we didn't have any social life anymore. And but this Raja has been in my life for like ten years now. Ten years. So, but it was my professional life. Um, and all of a sudden, during this pandemic, we 
a lot of people disappeared, a few left, and they became foundation. They became um, really something you can you can you can uh, lean on. And Raja was one of them. Uh, I think we talk on the phone almost every day for a year. And <laughs> at least even, even if it was just a couple of minutes, sometimes it was very short, but uh, we talked a lot together. Um, we thought a lot together. I remember even we cried together one day. I don't know why, because something happened. I don't know why, but... And, and we made some projects together. Um, Raja uh, curated a music festival last year in June online and same, he gave money to 12, 13, 14 artists, I don't remember, to create a short video at home, something simple um, and, and with interview and it was extremely fun and it was for the week of pride. So we did a lot of things together. Um, and, and, and that's why today I, um, he's, Raja is much more than just um, an artist I love, I admire. Um, he's, he's a real pillar in my life, real foundation. Yes, it's true. I don't say that because we are in camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and um, so that's why I thought, okay, if Raja is available, um, I would do with Raja, yes. And, and we worked together recently, so on a secret project. Yeah, what did you work together, uh, Raja? What did you? Ah, uh, we can with? say, we can say, we can say. It's a, a collaboration. No, not yeah, but total... stay tuned, stay tuned. Very soon, but it's a, it's a so, okay. Raja, where are big... you at the moment now? I'm at home. And home is? Uh, in New York, in Brooklyn. Yeah, you're in Brooklyn. Yeah. So, um, so do you go over sometimes to this space? Is it midnight and you dance in there, or? Um... <laughs> I yeah. wish if 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 Lucian gave me the keys, I would do this. You never I, ask for the keys. Yeah, well now I, yeah, I just got the idea that maybe I, you know, I really, I actually stay up very late um, and I call it my witching hours between like, you know, two and 4 a.m. I'm most, most creative then. And if I had keys to a studio, I would totally. I'd give, I'd give you the key. I, you never ask, but if you I ask, I would give you. But is, you know, like what, what's 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 Raja said um, earlier when when he said I, I told him do whatever you want. It's, it's actually that, that's not a favor I made to him because that's first that's what I'm saying to all the artists I'm working with. Uh, I don't want to interfere in their creative process. I think they have that in mind. And from the moment you talk to an artist to the moment of a project is done, of course everything is going to change and. It's 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 uh, it's good if everything changes. If nothing changes, that's not a good sign. And there is always this story. I love. I absolutely love to say, with um, Michael and Abby from Six Hundred Highwaymen. I saw. I went to a Prelude Festival at the Martin Siegel um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, place, and uh, there was like it was like like. A, a show every 10 minutes and arrived at the end of the day i was really exhausted i haven't seen anything really i was excited about and there was uh, michael and abby i knew them a little bit because they had the residency at the invisible dog but i didn't know them really well i was almost about to leave and i said okay it's the last one i go see it i saw it 15 minutes and i love it so at the end of the show i go see them and i said would you like to develop this project at the invisible dog yes Two days after, dates were set up, everything was fine. They arrive four months after for the first three years or so. And you know, my office at the Invisible Dog is in the gallery. I don't have an office upstairs. I'm really in the gallery. So I can see everything happening in the gallery. And I, the rehearsal started. And strangely, it was very different when, from what I saw before. And uh, But I didn't say anything. I thought it was my memory. I said, Maybe I forgot, that was four months ago. And um, the show happened. And at the end of the show, the last day was the record. At the last day of the show, we went for lunch together. And I told them, I said, by the way, that was not the show I saw in October, right? And they said, no, absolutely not. It was totally different. But you didn't tell me 
they said. And then they look at me and they said, but you didn't ask, Lucia. And I love this story because that's really the invisible dog. That's really, you come to the invisible, as soon as you're invited at the invisible dog, you can do whatever you want. And I have to say, this, this recipe has been very successful. Mm. Roger, thinking about this, which is very profound, you know, it sounds very simple, but this relationship between space... Oh, it's not simple. No, it's, 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 no it, it's not simple. It's but not, yeah. it's not simple. But that's... So if we want to talk about something more technique, I have to say, if you want to make your life... If I wanted to make my life as a director, as well, call me whatever you want, easy and simple, I would like to make the life of the artists who are working with me difficult. I would like to make the life for the people who are the audience member difficult. It's the opposite. I think exactly the opposite. I should make the life easier and simple for the artists to work and to the audience member. That's why you don't pay when you come at the Invisible Dog, you just make a donation. That's why I'm asking for artists, do whatever you want. But you're right, when you say that behind the background of that, the administration of that is extremely complicated. It takes much more time. And it's like almost 24 hours all the time because you have to adjust, there is no rules. The rules is just be respectful of the space, but inside that it's very flexible. So that doesn't make my life easier, but at least it makes the life of the artist much easier. And that's the most important. Yeah. Yeah. So Raja, for you, um, I mean, you have such deep roots also in the New York community, artist community. Um, what changes would you like to see? Um, you know, of course, not every space can be an invisible dog, but what do you feel is wrong and what can be corrected? What should, what should we pay attention to now? Producers, uh, presenters, everybody, scholars. Yeah, you know, it's something that really made me very upset in, I think, May or March or May of last year. And I, I wrote this article in for, for Dance Magazine that said, has anyone asked an artist what they need? And I really meant it. And it's something that is often not asked. And, and I feel now that I have to sort of beg or force my way into making the work that I want to make. And I have to sort of push away presenters and producers who feel that they want to have a heavy hand on my work. And so I think, I, you know, I think it's also a criticism of mine that so much performance and, and, and theater, and when I say theater and I mean theater, dance, music, et cetera, but I call it all theater, um, it starts to fall flat and it starts to all feel the same because the artists are giving the exact same resources and, and they're treated exactly the same. There's formulas that are created that seem and that, that want to support artists and they don't because we're not asking artists. Artists aren't being asked, what do you want? What do you need? How can I support you? And to Lucian's point, that would make things much more difficult for presenters and producers and theaters, et cetera. And so of course it's not asked. It's let's come up with a rubric, let's come up with a system, and then each artist will go through that system and then make something, and it's decided what, what we need as opposed to asked. And that small change would make the largest difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's true. What do you need? And I think Kimi, who was here from the Laundromat project, he once said also what I do now, which I didn't do before, if I remember shit. We also say, how are you? You know? So in that busy way of New York and that life, you know, maybe you, maybe you didn't ask that enough, how, how are you really? And you listen at the time, but also say, what do you need as an artist, you know? So, so these are, these are all, again, it sounds simple, but these are significant um, 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 changes that they would, would um, uh, take place. Um, I think I saw the, the, the Lucien 
created an evening to support also your dance company. I was there, I saw this beautiful flow also of bodies in that space which you adapted. Um, um, do you do you think uh, out of Corona will come that also dancers, choreographers say we, we move outside the um, you know or the uh, life art space, the dance places, uh, or is, will there be still not sure? Will there be say we we can wait to get back into the perfect dance spaces? What is in your community? What do you hear and you yourself? What are you thinking? You know, it's funny you should ask. It's something that similar to my last statement and. I actually went to Dance Magazine to write another article to which they refused to publish. But I, I told them, no one's, there's so much talk around like, you know, the coronavirus, there's so much talk around the scandals that are happening. No one's asking artists to talk about what their ideas are. You know, like, I, I, it doesn't, I, in, my, in my mind, I'm like, it's, who, who, who knows where, our performances will take place. Maybe they will be in theaters, maybe they will be outside, but let's let's ask the artists where their ideas are and let the ideas lead the way. But we're not where I don't feel that we're often asked to just dream. And we're and I don't think artists are asked enough to to imagine, you know, what what would you what if what would you like to do? Where would you like to do it? What, what, is the, what is the idea? What does that idea mean? Why do you wanna do that idea? Who do you wanna participate in that idea? What I think artists are led to do is feel like, oh, well, if I wanna do a show and I want it to be at this space, then I have to make it there or I won't get any support. So it starts to shape what we believe is possible. So there's the one way I could answer your question is like, whatever people make available to artists, artists will take and make, mm. you know? And if, if you ask an artist first, you know, wh what's your idea, what's your project? And then ask them, well, where does that want to happen? Then they might, they might feel the space to say like, oh, well, well maybe I want, you know, this theater to produce it, but maybe I wanted it to be outside. Maybe I want it to be underwater. Maybe I want it to be a video. Maybe I want it to just be like in an audio that I send to your computer, but it's still being produced by the theater without needing to go there. You know, I, I think our creativity wants to be nurtured so that it's actual creativity and not reactionary. Mm. So let's talk about you. If you that time of Corona, if, what would you like to do? What would you say, I, I, I would I, that's, is there something we said that thing that emerged, that manifested as an idea or as a project we say, this is now I would like to do, especially after this time we went through, um, is there something, um, or do you think it's like this Lucia, you need a space, you need a, a partner to create something. It's not a, a, a something in your mind alone. Yeah, well, yes and no, you know, funny enough, Let's, you know, funnily enough, if I think back to 2012 you know, or something, this theater that I was going to shut down and I called Lucien because I wanted the space and similar <laughs> in coronavirus, you know, the, 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 or the pandemic rather, things are shut down and I spent some time with Lucien and I said, I have an idea. <laughs> and then Lucien's like, you should do it. And then I did. You know, and sometimes that's all that it takes, you know, so and, and it was, I mean, my company and my collaborators, I think, still to this day are like flabbergasted that we were able to achieve what I think we may achieve by June. We'll see. We're currently still working on it. But, you know, there was a conversation once with one of my closest collaborators where she's like, I'm doing the work of six people you know and it and it's just like just and it and it and that wasn't necessarily a complaint i think it was but also just that this person is capable of doing that that we you know when, when we're given the space to like dream and to make something happen we can do that and so you know i asked i asked a theater can i have the space i asked lucien can you help me find some money i had to, i used these resources from different places to make a dream of mine come true. And, and that taught me something, which is like, maybe just keep doing that. 
maybe don't try to look for, as I mentioned to you before, the formula, but create create the create the avenue for yourself. And, and that's gonna look different. And hopefully when that's achieved, people will say like, oh, how did you achieve that thing? And then I can say, well, I, I asked for this from this person and I asked for this from that person and I asked for this and, 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 and people trusted me to do that. And maybe that's a new model or maybe that's just a new approach. I don't wanna say model actually, that's a new approach of thinking about like, oh, it's, it's all out there, but maybe it doesn't look like going to one place and, 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 and making one thing and then that place owns it and then it's under their rules. So, you know, there, there's many things I wanna do. I, I write, I make media, I make devised theater. Um, uh, and, and I wanna be able to have the freedom to do that when it, when it feels exciting or important for me to contribute to culture and not have to ask permission to do that um, and to be given space, room and the resources to really see it through. And, and I think also a little bit of liberty because the, the other problem here, and, and I hope this pandemic will change that, is the way arts or performing art is funded here. A um, lot of guidelines and finally like very, very little freedom when you apply for a grant and all of that it's there's a lot of um, restrictions um, on that so maybe the, the the funding should change also as you say not not another model but more flexible more simple more simple um, I remember um, during the pandemic uh, Raja said something to me he said, there was there was a, a grant, um, a small grant offered by an organization, and the application to get this money and the money was two hundred dollar at the end. The application uh, to get this money was absolutely insane. They were asking you for tons of people um, of paperwork and all of that. And I remember Raja told me, "We are humiliated enough. We don't need to be humiliated more." just to get $200 or $300. Because why? Because the application is complicated. The application asks for so much time and resource and you don't want to do all of that. Because again, they just want to create work. So if the funding in America change also, if it switch to something more flexible, different, more listening to what the artist needs, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Mm, yeah, no, this makes a very big uh, difference. And they tell something about the society way it treats the artists. We had a, a Daria Bassoni from Egypt, actually, also, yeah, on, and she said we had to fill out 12 pages, and then we had to call one phone number. And there was only one number in all of Egypt you could call, and you had to wait five or six hours. And at the end, you would get $50. You know? You see? And, um, and meanwhile, you know, if it works out, we will have Theater der Welt Festival, the theater of World Theater Festival. People were doing it in Germany at the moment, you know, and that region was able to give $200 million to artists um, as, a, as a resource. They are thinking what to do with it, you know, but um, everything is closed there. Germany is still closed down. Perhaps they cannot even show the festival. Uh, the program has been printed uh, as for the Wiener, Vienna Festival but without show times, without when it's gonna happen. There's a great confusion happening, but there is some support um, out there. Lucia, um, who inspired you? I mean, uh, I know you, you were the audience, but to say, I kind of want to run this, but this is what I like, but still there are you know, always institutions or people, or maybe other artists. What, what made you do this? Um, but were it musicians, uh, novelists, uh, playwrights, uh, presenter? Who 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 inspired you? Who do you look up to? Well, um, when I, when I was young, I wanted to be an actor, and so I started acting acting school. And but very quickly, I realized that I didn't want to do that. I was not very interested in being an, an, an artist or an actor and all of that. And at that moment, I've discovered that behind the stage, there is a whole world of tech, administrators, producers, electricians, I don't know, ushers, and all of that. 
And it has been an epiphany for me. I didn't know that when I was young. I had no idea I was watching uh, theater on TV and it was just a screen and you didn't know what's going on behind. So when I've discovered the, this whole world, I was absolutely fascinated. And I have to say, um, I've been lucky enough to work for 10 years with a guy named Stéphane Lissner. Um, he was the director of the Théâtre de la Madeleine, director of the Festival d'Aix-en-Provence, the director of La Scala in Milan, the, uh, recently the Opera of Paris, and now he's in Naples. And I worked 10, 10 years with him. And um, he, he, he taught me everything. He taught me uh, this point of ask the artist what they want and just answer yes to everything. And your life will be much easier. Don't try to make your life, their life, their life difficult. Your life will be difficult, but not there. He taught me all of that. Um, mm. The way he was working um, easy, fast, and again, leaving the, the artist would do whatever they want. So I had the chance to meet this man and, and he was very, very inspiring to me. Yes, he, he, he's my mentor, definitely. Mm -hmm. And um, but but um, I can do anything else. Maybe next year, in two years, in three years, if something happens, I don't know. I'll have to do something else. Awesome, Maybe. You. Raja, who do you look up to in the time of Corona now? Also in general, who do in the what inspired you in the last year? Is there something we say? This gave me a shot in the arm. <laughs> The vaccine the the you, are, what you are upset with, but is there also something where you felt this inspired me? Um, I really think it's my friends and collaborators. You know, I feel very lucky that the people who are my closest friends are also people that I collaborate and I, and I, you know, I include Lucien in that now because I've now collaborated with him so closely on a project. But I feel that people similar to what Lucien's Lucien saying when, when there are people around you who say yes instead of no, or let's figure it out instead of that's impossible, or yeah, uh, okay, I don't know what that means, but I trust you, that just opens up so much. And so my, my best friend is my closest collaborator, my husband is a performer in my company, my, my, my friends spouses work for the company. So it really, you know, it doesn't have to be a family, but that we're close and that we think together and work together and see the world differently and, and the same at the same time, that's really inspiring. And that, that sense of community is something that can be, can be easily ignored and something that I'm gonna try, something that, that I'm gonna hold on to. Mm. after this is over and, and how, how interesting and we have heard that also a lot on Siegel Talks it's actually not the screening of an artwork or you know that what we think but it's that idea of community um, that's through the arts but still the idea of uh, the closeness and what we perhaps were missing before without knowing it and we rediscovered it but it is actually um, that 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 uh, village around us, um, the one that Lucien said is a hundred people at the invisible dog. And I like the idea that you said the artists are invisible, but they are there, they are visible at the invisible dog. Uh, I didn't know that actually so many also, yeah, had their the studios there. Yeah, nobody, nobody really knows that. Yeah, yeah, they are it's, uh, something in, oh, oh, invisible, uh, what, what we came up with. Um, Lucien, uh, since you mentioned also before, and we see uh, that your stove behind you, uh, lots have been written. There was a big movement in performing arts and food and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, um, and the significance of it also for artists to say, you know, you have to cook your own meal in your own kitchen. There are recipes you can learn from them, but then you do variations. And uh, someone who cooks for you, that's, you know, more important to you than perhaps the best cook somewhere in, the, in the, perhaps in Singapore, um, or you, you won't get to, you know? So the idea of you do something locally, often family, Friend, the grandmothers. I know you have your grandmother uh, behind you, uh, up on the uh, on the wall next to your father. Um, what is the idea of, of food uh, uh, for you? You just you re and people told me about it. You have these evenings where you invite. I haven't been invited yet, so one day I have to now. But, um, <laughs> what is that idea? What did you discover? And how does it connect to your work? What you do is Raja and everything else. Tell us a bit. Maybe cook for us something. I don't know. 
Well, a, a couple of years ago, I, I, I got a new, a new passion for cooking. I, I didn't have that before. And, um, and of course, the pandemic helped uh, a lot to develop this passion. Um, what does real passion, passion mean? What does real passion for Lucia mean? mean? What's a real passion? It's obsession, actually. It's not passion. It's obsession. Okay. A passion for me is obsession. And, um, and, and actually, that's how I call my, my Instagram account, Lucien Chef Ambition. So it's, it's, a real, it's an ambition that really focus on obsession every day. And I, start to, I started to cook. And um, you know how it is here in America, and especially in New York. As soon as you do something, there's always someone to push you. So you, do, should, you should do more, do something with that. So I had this idea of creating the space where I am here now. It's called La Salle à Manger. La Salle à Manger means the dining room in French, but everybody calls now Sam, S-A-M. And um, I have a table of 12, and I invite friends, artists, um, supporters, people I want to put together. And we have here um, meals I'm preparing for them. And um, I am... I learned, I read a lot. I don't know, now I have maybe 300 cookbooks or maybe more. I read a lot about history of food, um, philosophy of food, um, uh, history of food, but also recipe I'm practicing almost every day. And, it, and I have to say that has been, for example, during the, during the pandemic, a real lifesaver because I gave three times a week recipe online. I was... Um, cooking live on Instagram three you times a week no and idea. and there was like tons of people following um, that and extremely happy to do that very simple following you? Um, on my Instagram I don't know uh, uh, 3,000 4,000 something wow, like that no I'm not idea. a big star yet not yet but 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 <laughs> but that was but that was also a way to connect with people and and when I was receiving pictures from people telling me I made your fish, I made your lemon tart, I made that. I was I was I was very very happy about that. Very. And uh, and I'm still I'm still cooking every day. Yes, still doing dinners, not at home anymore, but in the garden of the Invisible Dog, which is also a very nice place. So in the garden, yes. you invite some people to come in the outside and you eat. Yes, them. yes, absolutely, and to have dinner together. Yes. So Raja, how is his food? Honestly, have you have you? I mean, you, you haven't had it. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Well, you are lesser of a human until you've had it. <laughs> it's really life changing, in that it makes you feel more alive. It's so good. It's really, you know, I my, my I I don't my my grandmother is is a you know she's not a chef but she's you know a, a home cook she takes cooking very seriously and my husband does as well and you know it it's it, it really is something special when people talk about what goes into the food how you talk to food how you prepare it how you let it you know I'm impatient so cooking is not really something that is I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm impatient, but I also don't use microwaves. So there's that, but, but the care at which goes into it really does make a difference in how it tastes. And so to watch, you know, and, and if you've seen any of Lucien's YouTube videos or Instagrams yeah. to watch and read about how much time that goes into it and how much care that goes into it. And then to taste it, you, you can actually taste care and taste time and patience, it's amazing. Well, I, I had no idea about uh, that, that whole site and the YouTube videos and the Instagram, but it, it, it's a close connection from what I hear, how the, care you, the care you take, you know, of your friends, your family, your artists, and then um, and um, cooking. So Raja, did you meet people at his dinners you didn't know before and you stayed friends or? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that is something, you know, what, what theater does and what food does. So it's quite something. It's so often so many of us, you know, went to baking and cooking and this. I mean, I'm, I'm, everybody. I mean, I have a program here also. Last year, I have um, um, a, a botanist who came uh, for a week residency here. In, um, in October, I'm receiving a Palestinian chef uh, for a month and a half in residency here. And she's going to work on the whole history of um, 
the Palestinian food, um, I had um, with uh, uh, we made performances, readings, um, also. So, so in addition to the dinner itself, there is also uh, an artistic program. Not so much yet, but but I think I'm going to develop that um, very much. And of course, every time that there is an event at the Invisible Dog, I'm cooking something. They're amazing. Making, yes, of course. I'm right. making something simple but nutritive. Yes. So yeah. So I think people are asking, you know, um, how the world will change. How should performing arts look like? How do you present? What's going to be new? Well, if you look what the Invisible Dog has done, what Raja has done, you know, these things are already out there. We don't have to reinvent everything. But these are models. They are highly, highly original. They're different, but they do work. And we have to take that very serious, uh, what Lucien said, what Swaja said, for listening about asking what the artists want, the trust, the opening, the work for it. Um, and, um, and so this, these are models that can be done and would encourage everybody who's listening around the world, you know, you see an empty building maybe, say, yeah, well, Lucien did it, maybe I could start there too. Um, and he didn't know how this all will work out, where it's going to lead to. It could have also been a failure. But, I, but I didn't care about that. I didn't care about that. Yeah. So this is something instead, you know, and the, what, and the big trees, how little do we see from the Broadway theaters now? What, how much care do they give to the artists they work for? They haven't paid them. I don't know if they even produce masks. What did they do for the neighborhoods they are in? You know, also other big institutions in town, cultural ones. So really have to say, what did we do and uh, what uh, what should have been done. It's a big lesson to be learned. So, but Lucian, could you cook something or not? I was joking, but do you have something? No. Huh? No. Yeah, or not? Yes, if you want, I can make something. I can provide it, something it, like it that. It doesn't take too long. I mean, Raja said so much preparation goes into it. <laughs> no, I can, I can make, no, no, because it's lunchtime. So lunchtime usually it's simple things and very easy. Um, let me like look at my fridge. Do I have in the fridge? Uh, yes, I can do something very simple. Okay. Yes, give me a second. I, oh, look, change my costume. So, and if you want, I will send you the recipe after you can post it on your. Uh, okay, so this is an improvised session. Uh, so this is totally improvised. Now I'm going to get hungry. Yeah. Come for lunch, Boo Boo. I'll come over. <laughs> I'm on my Up. way. So um, what we can do, again, it's very simple and it's very original because uh, it's very, very tasty with an ingredient we usually not very much, it's zucchini. Okay. So zucchini, very often it's not very tasty. And so to do that, you need like, let's say two zucchinis, you see here, yes? Yeah. Two zucchinis. Uh, you need a knife. Up, you need a board like that. Then you need uh, a mandolin if you have that. If you don't have a knife, it's perfect. You need a little bit of olive oil, uh -huh. like this. You need curry. Okay. So this is a Japanese curry, but you can use your curry and 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 uh, up a little bit of heavy cream okay of course i'm french so there is cream everywhere cream and the pillow yes so let's start with that so first thing up you peel The zucchini is like that, and you leave a little bit of the green, okay? If yeah. you're, okay, always rinse your vegetables, even if they are peeled, always. Okay, why? Okay. One and two. So remember, the zucchinis are reducing a lot. So, if you're very hungry. Huh? Well, it's very simple. Rinse that. Let's try to make this recipe in 10 minutes, max. Okay. Then you dry that. 
okay? And then you slice them. So if you don't have a mandoline, you just make slices like that, not too thin to avoid the, to avoid the, so I can show you see something like that. Uh -huh. To avoid the, the, the zucchini like to melt completely. Of course, if you have that, it's much more faster. It's more dangerous, of course. You can cut your finger very easily with that, but it's much faster. Wow. Voila. Mm. So this one. That's also a, a Japanese mandolin. They are the best one. Okay. Not the German Westler, you think? No. <laughs> Voilà. Hop. Hop. Let's put this one here. So then you need, if you have a wok, yeah. it's perfect. If you don't have a wok, a, any frying pan, you put like a serious amount of olive oil. You warm that. And why I, I like the wok? Because in the wok, everything cooks. Um, much faster because oh. the way the heat is diffused in, in the wok makes everything go very, very fast. So we wait like a few seconds until. Can you see? Here? Maybe I should move my computer. Okay. Uh, can you see here? Yes. Uh -huh. so, yes. That a little bit higher, Not better, and very stable. Okay, and now your zucchini. Yeah. That's very simple, and you just leave them like that. I think five minutes. Mm -hmm. They will cook very quickly. Nice. Yeah, that's also cheap meal right the zucchini is about a dollar or something so it's quite quite uh, you know quite uh, healthy and, uh, and a good thing you know yeah it's very healthy there's just vegetable um curry and cream because cream yeah. is very healthy too people now you pay stop, four stop, or five yeah, dollars yeah you pay four or five dollars for a, a chocolate chip cookie you know and um, <laughs> and so this is something that uh, will sustain you from the day you see, so already, like, it's been like, what, one minute now? Yeah. You can always add olive oil if you think it is me. Amazing, Raja. Did you know that you would be part of the cooking show? Not really, right? I didn't know. I actually just went to go see if I had any of these things. I just went to yeah. check the fridge. I was like, I'm hungry now. I have pistachios. That's all I've got. Yeah. What can I do with pistachios, Lucien? You can make a pesto. Oh. With your pistachio, do you have anything green in your fridge? No, but there's a. I have a garden. I've got some oh, parsley. I've got some ramps. Oh, you have ramps? Yeah. Okay, so you get ramps. You never told me you have ramps. You never asked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you see now the zucchini. The zucchini are half. Yeah. Half cooked now already. So you get get your ramp, okay? And yeah. you have a you have a food processor, Raga? I do. Okay. So first of all, you um, put your pistachios in the food processor without the shell. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Never know with you, huh? Yeah. And then you mix. You make your pistachio in the powder, and then you add ramp. All the, the ramps you have. Yeah. You add olive oil. 
you add um, you can add like a, a clove of garlic Ooh. You want, yeah and then you mix all of that until it becomes something creamy and you make a pesto wow a pesto and you can do pasta mm -hmm. i i can't eat pasta but you can't eat pasta no yeah. why <laughs> <laughs> but what else can I put yeah. it on? Uh, can you eat bread? Yeah, you like bread. No, oh, you can eat bread. bread also. Okay. So what you can do really is eat rice. Yeah, rice. I can do some rice. You can mix that with rice. It's very now, good. Could I put it on like, like salmon? Could I put it on some fish? You can, it's a pesto. You can do whatever you want with it. But what is it going to be best with? Oh. Anything like bread is good, pasta is good, of course, rice is very good. But yes, you can make if you make a fish, for example, you can melt the pesto first and then cook the pesto, the meal, the, the fish in the pesto. Mm. Wow, okay. I love that. Like a sauce, so you start, make a sauce. And at the end, you put in the milk, or what are you what's going to happen? The cream, sorry, you put in the cream at the end. No, not yet. So you see, you're they are ready, almost ready. So you wait and, until they are really cooked. Okay, and when it's done, so here it's almost done. You take your curry first. You sprinkle curry on it. So same, here I put like three, Food, but if you don't like too much or you want more, you remix. So you see, the little trick is you see the zucchini are making water. You see the water here? Yeah. In the bottom, the zucchini will be really completely cooked when the water will be gone. They won't release any water anymore. And when it's like that, so you mix the curry, then there is curry everywhere. And then you take the cream. And up, you pour some cream. And here, you mix again. And you lower the heat. Because this cream should never boil. But what you want is the water of the cream to evaporate, to get thicker a little bit. And you just leave like that, same, a few minutes. Cook in the cream. And then it's Until, done. Do you see? Mm -hmm. and, it's a, and it's a beautiful color also. And you let the cream evaporate until they get thicker a little bit. And then you can serve that as it is, or it's a perfect, it's perfect with fish. Ooh. Also, it's very good with fish. Amazing. Amazing. Very simple. Lucia, thank you so much for that impromptu lesson. And, uh, and uh, uh, this is a big, big philosophical concept. Do home cooking in what you do for your own, but also in your art, collaborate, you know, and, um, and think about uh, who's going to come to eat, who's your audience is and uh, think about the ingredients and everything. So it just was a great, uh, a great uh, a talk. Yeah, go, go, see, go, see, go see my Instagram. Okay, yeah, of course, so check it. I, have, I had, had no idea about it. And, um, and um, can you share the recipe to publish? Uh, Thea writes here. Yes, I will, I will email you the recipe a little bit later. Yes, this Okay, afternoon. so we can put it on our site under the talk. And um, there's something and very important here to learn this. You know it's this idea of thinking about you know food and making it combining it fresh and local so um this is great rajas thank you for joining and uh i'm sorry we didn't ask you to cook but you uh, but it's was improvised oh it's better said, it's better if he doesn't cook yet if he doesn't, yeah but well, he's doing a good teach now if you, right if, if you I'm... make the zucchini so both of you as uh, thank you really thank you thank, thank you. you this was a a, a real um important and significant talk. I think we really highlighted also that time we live in, but also spreads a little bit of optimism um, that, we, um, that we need. And tomorrow, um, if uh, our listeners have the time, we have a significant, very important artist from Russia. It's uh, Kirill 
Serebrenikov, uh, one of the great directors uh, of this world, also a filmmaker, um, someone who was fired now from his great Gorky theater and turned a small theater into an important one. He has been under house arrest by the Russian authorities. And he is one of the great, uh, great creators and um, the European Theater Award uh, for, for new direction. And um, it was not so easy to reach to him. Also, I think for him to talk, but we will have a session with him tomorrow. So we're gonna hear what does it mean if you're an artist in Russia um, who criticizes the government, what happens to your theater, what happens to you, what happens to your life, and in the time of Corona, so it will be a great update. So um, we will hear if it all works out um, uh, from uh, Theater der Welt uh, next week, from Kari Perloff, um, and, um, and we're going to have Abhishek back and uh, Anna Rupa Roy from India uh, from the devastating situation which we're experiencing in New Delhi. So thank you both. Thanks for HowlRound um, for hosting us again. We went a little bit over time. Thanks for having us. They will forgive us, but um, um, this is uh, this was important. And uh, Lucien, thank you for improvising and putting this up. Thanks for a little bit. Sure, you think it's ready now? Uh, to, to suggest. I can show you ready. No, yeah. it's ready. You see how is it? The, the, the cream has thickened uh -huh. a little bit. Uh -huh. It's ready to serve. It's fantastic. So. Fantastic. Amazing, amazing. And uh, are you going to eat it? I'll invite you soon. Are you going to oh, eat if it? I'm going to eat it now? Yes, yeah. yeah fantastic. OK, so yes. put, a, put a photo on Instagram and say yes. you made this at the CD Toys. Thank you, Raja. Again, thank you. I hope I uh, will see what you're cooking up uh, with Lucien for the June release and for the September. And I hope soon we will be able to see your great choreography again, that beautiful work, what you do with your ensemble. One also had a feel it was a real ensemble of dancers, what you created. And um, it's a great, great New York work. So thank you all. And uh, again, thank you. Everyone. And thanks to your audience for sticking with us a little bit longer than usually in case you did. So thank you and all the best. Bye bye, Lucian. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.